Good morning. Great to see you guys. For those of you who don't know who I am, maybe you start coming in June or July or August. I'm Kirk Yamaguchi, and I'm the French guy. And <laughs> I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's, it's great to be up here to, to be with you guys. I hope you had a good Labor Day weekend, and uh, you ready to get into the Word of God together? Okay, we won't a sec. But first, I wanted to uh, share a little bit about this marriage retreat that we have coming. And uh, it's coming in the end of October. And the, uh, the reason we want to say something about it now is the registration uh, is up on September 21st. So you only have about eight days to get your registration in. There is a brother, his name is Richard Godsill. He is uh, a pastor in, down in Montrose and a great communicator, very passionate about marriage and families, and a very engaging speaker, because one of the things at the last marriage retreat when they did a survey is they said, can we get a live speaker? And so Richard will have a great encouraging and challenging message for uh, couples and soon-to-be couples. And so if you would like to go to the marriage retreat, I encourage you to go to canyonviewchurch.com and go to the website and get registered. And if you have any questions, you can contact the church. And uh, let's, uh, uh, Teresa, I was gonna say her husband. Teresa McPherson will answer all your questions and fill you in. So bless you guys today, it's good to have you here. And don't you love fall? It's not fall yet, but it's, it's coming. Because as I see orange across the room, and there's a few other odd colors like dark blue with a star on it. Is there any black with pirates on it? We'll pray for you guys. But this is also the season that in the Grand Valley that there's certain people here that become very busy in the fall because they're winemakers. We know all the vineyards that are here. And, and uh, so I don't know squat about making wine. I thought you just put a bunch of grapes in a vat and squish it and add some food color and you got wine. <laughs> so I, I have a friend, Brad Carroll here, who loves making home wine. And so he's kind of teaching me some of the stuff. We, uh, and he, he says, you need to know what kind of grapes you have. I said, what do you mean kind of grapes you have? Grapes are grapes, right? He goes, actually, there's a grape that's a Merlot grape. And there's a grape that's a Riesling grape. I said, there's different grapes? He goes, absolutely. And I said, well, how do you tell what grapes are what grapes? He said, you take the leaves to the CSU extension, and they'll tell you what kind of grapes you have. <laughs> I said, really? Yeah, he says, because you have to know exactly what kind of grapes you have to know exactly what kind of wine you can make and what you need to do to make that particular wine. I said, God, I didn't know there was such a science to it. And so the point I wanna make with that is you can't judge a grape by its cover. <laughs> right? It could be a green grape, but you don't know if it's one kind or another. And the same if it's a red grape. And I think Jesus was kind of making a point with this when he was telling everybody he was teaching to, he, he said this in Matthew 7, 16. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. What Jesus is saying is, man, we can't disguise what's inside. What's in our heart will eventually be revealed by our actions. And so what we tend to do is, is we put on facades and we act a certain way. We can even dress a certain way. We use a certain language to appear like we're spiritual. But the reality is, if there's not a heart transformation, the 
sin, our, the flesh, will eventually take over. Jesus himself said that what is done in darkness will be brought to light. So what has happened in the church in the U.S., or in the West, maybe? Dallas Willard is a, was a theologian and philosopher. He wrote a book called The Divine Conspiracy. And in his book, he talks about the pitfall of American evangelicalism. Now, I have attempted about six times to read through The Divine Conspiracy. I read through one page, and I go, I don't know what the foul ball that guy just said. <laughs> so I found a guy who kind of explains what he's saying to me in common English. This guy's name is Scott McKnight. This is what he describes what Dallas Willard is surmising about American evangelicalism. He said, American evangelicalism is what it is because of its gospel, meaning we don't have the right gospel. He says, Dallas Willard calls its gospel the gospel of sin management. Now hold on to that, because I think Dallas Willard is just right on, and this is so insightful of what we have bought into as a church. It says, its emphasis is forgiveness of sin, eternal life in heaven, assurance in the here and now, and either an act or decision or acts, good deeds, are the precipitating element that gains a person access to salvation. So what it really is, is a religious mindset. And here's what a religious mindset actually can look like. So we think that all we need to do is pray the prayer. Okay, I ask for forgiveness, I confess my sins, I'm in. And then we think, I just need to be a little better than I was. And out of our own efforts, we try to change who we are. And this is what happens, is a religious spirit can begin to incorporate that. And what the pitfall of that is, is the only way that we can feel any sense of relief from the strain of never measuring up, is we look down our noses at other people that aren't as righteous as us. It's very easy to do. Oh, that person, oh, they don't go to church as much as I do. Oh, those guys are doing this, and, and they, if you only knew what they do on Friday night. Right? Or the other side of that is we look at other people that are more righteous than us, and so we never feel like we measure up. And so we're defeated before we even begin that we just aren't managing our sin very well, and so we're just losers in God's eyes. So this pitfall of an American evangelicalism, it sets us up that our mindset doesn't allow God's spirit to come in our hearts and transform us from the inside out. Because what the kingdom of God is about is two things. Now, as we go through this series that starts next week called uh, Literally Jesus, I, I read through this book through the whole summer called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by a theologian by the name of Kenneth Bailey. It is the most profound, insightful book on Jesus that I have ever read. And so I came back and Jane says, Kirk, I think you need to preach on that because you are so excited about what you learned this summer. She totally transformed my theology of Jesus. But what we see here, what Paul is talking about in Colossians is allowing the mindset and the philosophies of the world begin to become incorporated with a false gospel, and then we live out a life that God never intended us to live. He says this in Colossians 2.18. says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism 
and worship of angels going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, which is Jesus. Okay? So what we have to understand is it's all about Jesus and holding fast to him because of what he's done for us. Because he said, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. What he's saying is then the Holy Spirit transforms us and we grow not by efforts that you and I do to manage our sin better. You see that? Okay, so does that mean when we understand the gospel and by faith we embrace what Jesus did for on the cross, did for us on the cross, does that mean we are free and we can do whatever we want to do? Uh, no, 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 no. Because what happens is when we fully understand the gospel and he transforms our heart through the indwelling spirit, then we desire to do things differently because of God's love within us. So from this book, there are two things that we are gonna focus on for the next few weeks as we go through this series. And these two things are weaved through this whole process of, of following Jesus. And this is really important for us to get grab hold of this. It's atonement, okay, and incarnation. Let me, let me unwrap that a little bit. What atonement is, is that we allow the Spirit of God to give us the forgiveness of sin through what Christ did for us, okay? So it's because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that through what he did for us, that he who was sinless, God became man through Jesus, and he came to die on the cross for us, so that through that, the penalty of our sins are atoned for. Christ paid the price for us. So we don't have to become sinless in order to be received by God. He did the work for us. Grab hold of that, okay? Since Christ did the work for us, then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. That's the incarnation of the gospel, is Christ comes in us. And some of you think, I'm too tarnished. There's no way God can come and live in me with what I've done. But because of what Christ did for you, he makes it possible that we become saints, not sinners, by what Christ did for us. So turn to your neighbor and say, if you have faith, in Christ, you are a saint. It's not by works. It's not by you sinning less, but it's by faith. But then when Christ comes, he begins to change us. So Paul being in prison when he wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, Someone came back to him and said, hey, Paul, that church in, Col in Colossae is a getting a little weird. They're incorporating some pagan worship, and they're incorporating it into their own kind of gospel. Paul, you got to say something to them. And so that's what the book of Colossians for, is for, is to get them back on track of the atonement of Christ in the incarnation of the Spirit within us. So when the Spirit of God comes and dwells within us, that it translates into a different heart, okay? In a sense, we all become the right kind of grapes. I told the service last week, because of the work of the Spirit in your life, I mean last, week, last service, and the work of the Spirit within you, by the time you get to heaven, you will be five foot two in Asian. <laughs> you will look just like Jesus. You didn't know that, did you? 
but it starts with having the right kingdom in our hearts. Gotta have the right kingdom. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you gotta have the right kingdom in your heart. And so you ask, what is the right kingdom? That's a good question. Let me look at this. What the right kingdom is, is what reigns and what rules our hearts. Is it the self or is it the kingdom of God? And man, this can be so cloudy to us and, and we will vacillate in and out of being in and out of the right kingdom, can't we? But the focus should grow more and more to the point that it's the kingdom of God that we are focusing on and that we want to bring glory to him through our lives. So that's what Paul's saying here in, in Colossians 4 is he's focusing on what it looks like when the Spirit of God dwells in us because of the atonement of our sins that he makes it possible for the Spirit to dwell within us. And this is what it looks like when our hearts become transformed from the inside out, right? In verse one, it says, Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. What, what he's really basically saying is the principle that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, 11. He said, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Have you ever had a horrible boss? Raise your hand if you have had to work under a horrible boss. I've had a boss before that I swear he was the embodiment of Satan. <laughs> but how many of you have worked under a boss that was honoring, that served you, that wanted you to become the best that you could be, and was so encouraging to you? How many of you had a boss like that? That's the kind of boss you need to be. That's what he's saying. Because a slave is not a possession anymore when we have the right kingdom mentality. Your employee, if you're supervising a group of people, is not something for you to use to give you more elevated position and authority. They're people of God, created in God's image. So he says, treat them like you would want to be treated with honor and respect. And by the way, I think if we turn that the other way, is treat your boss the same way, if you are under somebody. It, why do we do that? Because the focus is on the kingdom of God. It, it changes the whole ball game that we are here to honor Christ. Now, how do we know we have that heart? Really, it starts with prayer. And I want you to just kind of think about how you have prayed in the last 30 days. If you've prayed, maybe you haven't even prayed. But when a prayer is self-focused, what it's showing us is Kirk's kingdom is on the throne, not God's. So, for instance, if I am in need of a job, Lord, give me a job because I'd really like to have a new car because I want a car that is a chick magnet. <laughs> There's something inherently selfish in that kind of a prayer, right? It's self-focused, and we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers. But it changes when you say, Lord, you know that I need a job. And Lord, I pray that you lead me to the right job where you will use me as your salt in the world. And Lord, if you give me this promotion, I will honor you and I will give the resources back to you that you want me to give because you have blessed me with this promotion. Do you see the difference? Because it's kingdom focus, it's not Kirk focus, or put your name there. Joe focus, Sally focus. That's what happens when we follow the right kingdom. 
It's letting God's spirit reign in our hearts. The second thing is the right kingdom leads us to a kingdom lifestyle. It changes how we live. When we understand what Christ has did for us and we realize that the incarnation of him coming within us, we see the, the magnitude of what Paul said in Romans 8, verse 1. Paul said, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is the atonement, right there. He says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Because what the law does is it leads us to death because we can never measure up. You understand that? Then he said, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, that's us, could not do. We can't become sinless. We can't manage our sin where we are good enough for God because he's a holy God. He says, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, which is man, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us managing our sin better, but by what Christ did for us on the cross. You see what the gospel is? Are you understanding this more? And then he said, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the what? The spirit, incarnation. So when the spirit of God dwells within us because we have been forgiven and our sins have been atoned for, the spirit of God begins to start taking over. Little by little, the spirit of God begins to start transforming us because of what Jesus did to make us free from sin. Now, this new life, this new calling that God gives us is an outwardly focused life. We see this in verse two of Colossians four. We're just gonna go through verse six here. It says, continue steadfastly in, there's the big P word, what? Prayer, okay. We need to become prayer for people, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Meaning that because of what Christ did for us out of our thankfulness, then we begin to start having a kingdom purpose and the kingdom outlook on life out of thankfulness, not out of, I hope I get into heaven someday. And then he says, at the same time, pray also for us. Here's where you start seeing Paul's outward focus. He says that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. He's praying, now just pray that the Lord would deliver us from being in prison so that we can be free to go proclaim the gospel. That's a kingdom focus, isn't it? He didn't say, pray I get out of prison because it's awful in here, but he's saying, pray that I would be released so that we can do what God calls us to do. And he said that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Then he says, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders making the best use of the time. You see the difference of what he's saying his focus is? Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Continue steadfastly in prayer. That's what happens when God gets a hold of our heart and we begin to start having a kingdom focus. It starts with prayer. You know, uh, if you haven't done this yet, raise your hand if you've gone to see the movie War Room yet. Okay, I, I would hope that you would take some time in the next day or two, go see that movie over at the car mic. It's awesome. And, and in this movie, there's a, an elderly woman that uh, asks a guy to come, or a woman to come list her house to sell it, and she eventually shows her her favorite room in the house, and it was a closet that she made into her war room. Because the point being is that that's where she goes to war. That she goes in there and she has all these lists of all these people she's praying for, 
She goes there and she goes to battle. She goes to war and she prays. And I won't give away the story of what happens. But the point I want to make is that this is what Paul is calling us to do. The same thing is we go to war. And we go to war on our knees. Because the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. If I ask, do you have loved ones, family members, or friends that are very far away from Christ and their life is going down the drain? If, you, if I ask that question, I know probably everyone in this room, you'd raise your hand, wouldn't you? And so what do we do about it? We go to war on their behalf, on our knees. And as we pray, that's where the kingdom of God begins to come. Now, what is inherent in what Paul is saying here is when we have a kingdom focus, we're, we're outwardly focused, not inward. I've said this before, what, what happens to the church in America is we say, close the doors, pull down the blinds, and we bunker in to protect ourselves from a world out there that ye will. <laughs> and so what it translates to is eventually we only have Christian friends, and we only hang out with Christian people, and we only do Christian things at least when they're watching you. You carry my drift on that. And I describe this as we become like puppies licking each other in a box. It's kind of gross, isn't it? But that's what the church has become. And it's no wonder that the church is irrelevant in the American culture because we are making no difference in the world. It's because we aren't outwardly focused. We aren't doing what Jesus said to go love your neighbor as yourself. And this is what prayer begins to do is it begins to cause us to have an outward focus. I love what Paul said in verse three again. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Then in verse five, conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the best use of your time. Making the best use of your time to make an impact in the world. And one of the things we've seen with our cell group ministry here is that people are getting this. They're catching the vision that God wants to use them to reach people outside. And this is one of the things that's really hard to navigate. You know who it's, who it's hardest for the people to really be focused outward? It's the pastors here. Because we're so busy working in the church and we're so isolated from the world through the ministry for the church, we really aren't being in the world and being salt in the world. And so Jane and I constantly are talking about this tension of how do we be in the world to truly be salt to the world. And you know, salt is a preservative, right? Salt adds flavor. You know, one of the things that the Asians got down their gift to the world is soy sauce. <laughs> soy sauce is black liquid salt. Whatever you put soy sauce on, it just brings out a magical flavor. You know, I, I, I challenge you to try this this afternoon. Take your shoe. Sprinkle some soy sauce on it, dab some wasabi mustard on it, take a bite from the sole of your shoe, it will be a culinary masterpiece. <laughs> so are you soy sauce to the world? Or do we hunker in and keep the gift of Christ to ourselves? This is what Paul is doing, is, is we've got to be salt to the world. 
And it doesn't happen without us being intentional. Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you praying for those that God is putting in your life that you just start developing a heart for because of God's heart in you and you just start praying for them, you start inviting them to Bronco games, you start inviting them to barbecues, you start inviting them to your bar mitzvah or whatever you're into. And what happens is through loving them and praying for them, you eventually see God begin to start moving in their hearts. But are we that mindful of it? Are we that intentional? So with that, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. What Paul is encouraging us to do here is when we understand the atonement of what Christ did for us and the incarnation of Christ within us, and then he's sending us to be salt in the world, is we start thinking and praying differently. So Jane told me a couple weeks ago, hey, we got this flyer that our neighborhood is having a neighborhood barbecue. Now, we, we all know in America, the reason why we aren't having any impact in the world is because of this button in our cars that opens up the garage door. We drive into the garage, we push the button, the garage door shuts, and then we go into our backyard with a six-foot privacy fence. And we wonder why we don't know our neighbors. I built a fence that was cheaper because it was only five feet to be a <laughs> privacy fence. I thought if I had a four-foot privacy fence, I could be like Mr. Wilson <laughs> on home improvement. And my neighbor would see these squinty eyes looking over the fence and giving all this pundits of wisdom. What would happen if we all got rid of our privacy fences and we were able to talk across the fence to our neighbor and to know what's going on in their life and to love our neighbor as ourself? So this, this barbecue that our neighbor had had, you know, I gotta confess to you, I'm insecure. So walking up to this home with all these people that I don't know, it's kind of scary. But we just went and uh, we wanted to just be salt to our neighborhood. So we're talking, meeting people, and the, the host of the home, they, obviously they knew who I was. I didn't know who they were, but they asked me to save Grace for the, the dinner. So I said, Grace, and uh, afterward, they start cleaning up, and so we started helping clean up. We wanted to serve them. And I helped the lady take some stuff to her car, her and her husband, and we're helping load her car with the stuff they brought. And she looked at me and she goes, have you ever spoken at Canyon View? <laughs> Maybe a couple of times. I said, I'm actually the pastor there. I knew I've seen you somewhere before. like there's a gazillion short Asian guys here, right? <laughs> and she goes, We've, I've been there a few times. I said, well, come on back. We'd love to have you. Right away, she went on my prayer list. Just started praying for her. Prayed for her this morning. You see, that's where we're kind of when we're, when we're dialed into the things of the kingdom, we're, we're just seeing where the low-hanging fruit are. And we're seeing who those that where God may be moving in, and we just pray for them, and we make ourselves available to be salt in the world. That's what happens when we have a kingdom of God focus. That's what I love about our cell group ministry. If you haven't been to a cell group yet, just encourage you to try one. Because what it is, is we are creating space in our cell groups to welcome in people outside so that they can come in and experience the truth of the atonement and the incarnation of a loving God. And so it's really important, friends, that we begin to practice to learn how to pray. This month is our prayer focus month. I encourage you to get information on that. 
and come join Sue King and her team and come and pray with them. And that's what I believe is when God begins to move. It's kind of like on D-Day, if they didn't bomb the heck out of the Germans on those shores of France, when they sent in the troops, they would have been mowed down completely. And that's what prayer does. It breaks down the walls of the enemy and it begins to start softening people's hearts that they begin to become open to the good news of the atonement of Christ and the incarnation of his presence. But it starts with us praying. And we're gonna do that right now. So let's stand. Here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. Find two or maybe three people around you and get in a circle, huddle up, and start praying for one person that God has put on your mind. And just pray for that one person. And each of you pray for that person. Pray in agreement as you pray together. And let's continue from this day forward. That one person you pray for, put them on the top of your list and pray for the kingdom of God to move in their life every day. So we're just going to let the music play quietly as you pray together. Let's do this.